<clears throat> Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's Chem Careers uh, webinar. Um, today we're really going to be talking about how to kind of manage unemployment, um, really offering a practical guide to help you back into the world of work. Uh, my name is Robert Bowles, I'm a career specialist here at the RSC. We give a lot of advice to our members who are un unemployed, um, looking to get back into work. Um, and I'm also joined by uh, Fawzi Abu Chaheen, who's currently working at SPECAC, um, but was unemployed for quite a while. Uh, so what a lot of what we're going to be talking about is really kind of related back to his experience of being unemployed, how he managed it, and actually how he managed to get back into the world of work. So Fawzi, could you just introduce yourself and just tell a little bit about your circumstances and uh, how you... Sure. Yep. Yep, so um, I finished a, a PhD in Bristol a few years ago and after that I did a postdoctoral research position in Finland all on physical chemistry and um, at the end of the contract I uh, really had no uh, experience of the outside world and um, made quite a few mistakes before I realised um, that the approach that I was applying um, for applying for jobs outside of academia was um, not very useful. So. I listed all those mistakes um, into uh, a book and um, I realized that actually this is quite a useful resource so I, I turned it into a free to download PDF um, which I'll talk about later on but this webinar is going to highlight a lot of the key points that I realized and hopefully you will make the same mistakes. Okay, that's great, Fawzi. Thanks very much. So I've just got a, a few polls that we're going to launch throughout the webinar just to get a feel for kind of who's, who's joining us today. Um, if you do want to ask any questions Basically, you can type it in, and what we'll do is we'll go through the questions at the end of the session. Um, so do just stay online, do type them in. I'll be able to view them as they come up, and uh, rather than interrupting the flow, we'll try and get to them all at the end of the session. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, so I'll just start off really just to get a feel for who it is that are joining us today. So the first question um, should be appearing on your screen now. Uh, and that's really how many of you are currently unemployed? So it's the vast, vast majority of you. Uh, we've got, okay, so most of you have voted now. So yeah, 80% of you are currently unemployed at the moment. So that's great. So we are talking to the right audience. Uh, the rest of you, I'm assuming, are possibly likely to find yourselves in that position in the future or are kind of preparing in case it does happen. So thanks for sharing that information. The next question I've got for you um, is really, again, just to kind of get a feel for who it is that we're talking to. Um, so are you a graduate? Uh, do you have a PhD? Or do you have a kind of academic or postdoc experience? So again, if you could just answer that on screen as well, that would be lovely. So they're coming through now, really, really, nearly there, really good split. Uh, so we've got 20% graduate, 20% have a PhD, uh, and 60% are kind of coming to us from an academic or postdoc background. So <laughs> I don't know if there's any significance to that. Um, yes. We'll get into that a bit more <laughs> go forward. Um, and then the final question I've got for you is really just to kind of get a feel for what sort of role you might be looking for. Um, so is it academic, uh, work within the scientific industry, uh, you leave science completely, um, have you had enough, or are you looking for anything you can get or another type of role? <coughs> okay, so again, that's quite significant. Uh, we've got 80% looking for a scientific role. Um, and a bit more of a split between academic, uh, leaving science, uh, or anything they can get. So that's great. Okay. Um, that's really helpful because that actually does kind of give us a bit of a feel for who we're talking to. It does seem to be quite a few with academic background experience like 4Z that may be looking to kind of leave academia or not looking to pursuing academic roles. But we will kind of mention that as well. So a lot of what we're going to be talking today is actually going to be applicable across all those different sort of roles. So... Um, yeah, if you are looking to get back into academic roles, hopefully we've still got something to offer you today. So that's the kind of bit over, that's the main bit over with. Um, so what we're going to cover today is really thinking about 
how to how you handle unemployment. Um, there are a lot of aspects of being unemployed. There's, uh, we, we go through those, um, and actually practical things to do as well. So again, this is very what we want to focus on today is very much things that you can be doing while you're unemployed to lessen the impact of it, um, to make it easier for you to cope with. Um, and finally, we're going to finish off really like about getting back into unemployment. So the process that you're going through. Now, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on search and applying for jobs. Um, there's a lot of other material on there out there already. We've done sessions on that in the past, but we are going to talk about it really in context of being unemployed currently and also how to deal with interviews, how to kind of handle the offers when hopefully they do come in as well. So that's what we've got for you today. Hopefully it's what you're looking for. Um, so I, just start off, we thought this is a really important aspect. And Fawzi, do you want to kind of talk us through a little bit? Um, yeah, I yes, sure. I tend to get underestimated a little bit, just the emotional aspects of being unemployed. Yes, so um, I, I really went into uh, unemployment without having a clue as to what was in store. Um, there's a huge amount of loss of confidence that you experience and um, uh, your self-worth and how you value yourself decreases. You expect um, to get jobs. Um, well, you don't expect to get rejections as well, so that's a lot of these things suddenly happen that you haven't had experience of um, and one of the biggest challenges is to keep um, positive and, and uh, motivated throughout the unemployment process so that's what we're going to uh, talk about today. That's great. Um, <laughs> self-worth they can be quite destructive. Um, I will just say at this point you know being unemployed being out of work that is becoming more and more common for a lot of people now a lot of people do find themselves in that position even after a relatively successful career um, so, you know, it's not a personal thing, um, but a lot of people do take it personally. So being able to kind of cope with that is real, something that you need to be aware of. And hopefully what we do today can kind of help you with that. So, yes, so, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, if there is um, a rejection, it's not necessarily because you're bad. It might just be um, how you've um, how you've presented yourself. So learning how to... Um, market yourself um, and demonstrate your transferable skills if you compare a successful application and uh, an unsuccessful one by the same person you can really see the difference so uh, that takes a bit of time and uh, skill to, to develop those techniques and that's something we'll see moving on to later thanks a lot for that Pauzi. um so while while you are unemployed obviously we want you to get back into work as quickly as you can i'm sure you do as well um, so here's some activities for you to think about kind of while you're waiting. Um, and the top one really kind of comes back to the point Fawzi was making about being able to kind of relate and understand what you have to offer um, members, uh, sorry, employers. Um, so being able to list your achievements, um, that has two purposes. One, it kind of puts you in more of a positive state of mind, uh, but it also helps you to prepare your CV. So a lot of people will use a CV to just list what they've done. But actually, if you can actually then put your achievements and add your achievements to your CV, it becomes a much stronger document. Um, other things are really just about kind of activities to do while you wait that kind of keep you active, keep your brain going. The more active that you keep, the more interest you have while you're not actively working, for, actively looking for jobs or working will be really useful. Um, so being able to read, write, if, you're, if that appeals to you. Taking exercise is particularly important. Um, you know, do keep active. It's very easy just to kind of sit at home waiting for the phone to ring or checking emails and applications. The more exercise you do, the better you'll feel about yourself, the healthier you'll be. You know, a lot of people can use the opportunity to learn a new skill. You know, if there's something that you've always wanted to do but never had the time, it could be a hobby, it could be something that's related to what the sort of job that you want to get back into. But again, being able to learn a skill, that will boost your confidence. That might be a skill that's relevant to your employers as well. Um, being able to reward yourself. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that, Fawzi, why you put that on there? Yes. So um, um, re rewarding yourself. Um, if you um, want to learn, for example, um, how Excel really works, um, how to ma make a macro or how to use a pivot table, uh, you can use... Um, YouTube, which is a free resource to to learn these skills while you have a bit of time, you're developing yourself and you're actually learning something that you can use for future employment. So you've actually rewarded yourself um, in that respect. Um, so th these are 
they're, they're an easy way to learn skills that are free um, and they boost your uh, CV and skill set. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, and and the, the final thing there, volunteering, um, that's something that you did for us, isn't it? Do you just want to talk a little bit about that and why, why you think it's important to be doing that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that you lose when you um, become unemployed is structure to your day. And um, the activities that uh, Rob and I were talking about earlier um, really uh, do help to create a bit more routine and structure in your day. Volunteering is another great one. And it's also very good because it adds, um, it adds to, to the local community. They benefit and you benefit. Um, you help people who are in need of your time and skill and assistance and you get to develop your own set of skills. Um, so, for example, I spent um, three hours every fortnight teaching homeless people to read uh, and learn English and help them with their IT skills. And that really made me feel a lot more useful. Um, I suddenly was doing something. I was looking forward to those three hours that I had to go and visit the, the charity. And at the end of it, you, you do actually demonstrate you've got very good communication skills because I had to speak with a very broad range of people. Um, and you get a certificate at the end of it, which you can put on, say, LinkedIn. So these are very, um, very easy things to do, um, very rewarding, and they, there are lots of volunteering opportunities for every uh, preference. So if you want to go litter picking or, or teach in a school or you know, visit the elderly, there's lots of things you can do that are really rewarding, they boost your CV um, and actually make you feel better. And, and I think that's really important, that they're kind of making yourself feel better, rewarding yourself, getting something out of your day, having the structure, they're all really good points. I think the other thing about being able to boost your CV, what you can actually do, one of the big issues with being unemployed is what you put on your CV, how you account for that time when you're not currently in working. So again, mm -hmm. if you're able to put down that you're volunteering during that time, it kind of, it, it fills a gap. And again, it, it kind of helps to kind of get over how you actually deal with kind of being unemployed on, on your CV. So we definitely recommend you, you kind of think about that if, if you do have scope to do that where you are. Absolutely. Um, here's some other things as well. Um, so again, you know, contact your, your former colleagues. Now that may not necessarily be uh, the, the place that you're working at most recently. It could be earlier than that. Um, and this is basically networking. So I'm sure you've all heard about networking, the importance of it for getting a job. But the key thing here is to be asking for something specific. So, you know, are there roles coming up at that organisation? Can they give you advice about the sort of thing that you should, they think you should be applying for? Can they introduce you to someone in a particular organisation that can help you? What we tend to find where people network, when people try and make these reconnections, if you're asking for something specific, um, you're more likely to get a much more positive re result rather than just kind of saying, oh, yeah, let's just catch up for a, for a coffee. If you actually kind of ask for something specific, don't be afraid to ask for something specific. Uh, people do tend to try and help if they can. Um, also, while you're an employee, you know, the importance of dressing well, looking after yourself. Again, having kind of confidence in, in yourself, your appearance, that's really important as well. Um, there are ways to save money as well. Obviously, if you're not currently working, your income can be an issue. You're, I'm sure financial worries are going to be added to the, the worry of finding a job as well. There are ways of doing that. Uh, we mentioned some there. Um, and for, as you mentioned earlier as well, again, the kind of importance of maintaining daily routines. Do you want to just expand on that a little bit more? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's not just um, the loss of um, your finances that uh, affect uh, your mental state. It's the, a change in the quality of life. So um, it, when, you, when you're becoming unemployed or when you are unemployed, you, you might lose a lot of independence. Um, you might have to move back home, for example, um, or you might move away from your partner. And um, the, these, uh, these are the real change from your daily life. So if you try and get back into a, a routine or add some structure, um, either by um, going out or doing the activities that we mentioned earlier, this can really um, help you take control of um, a situation where you don't really have control. So it's all about um, improving your mental state and, and having a very positive outlook. That's it. I think that point about, that point about maintaining control is, is really important. I think people tend to be stressed when they find themselves in a situation where they don't have any control over. And by its very nature, being unemployed is exactly that situation. So anything you can do to kind of keep back control of some part of your life 
is really important. Uh, here's some other things to be watching out for. Um, so strains on your relationships. So Fawzi you alluded to that a little bit. You might have to move away. You might find uh, there are other issues there as well. For example, if you're at home during the day, your partner's going to work. You know, they're going to come home. They're going to be tired after work. You're just going to go and talk to them. Um, but they may not want that. They're also going to be kind of asking you to do jobs. They're also going to be asking you, you know, what have you done today? So that relationships can can have kind of come under quite a lot of strain when you're unemployed. Um, shotgun applications. Do you just want to mention what that is, Fawzi? I think I know what that is. Yeah. Do you just want to explain why so you should be watching out for that? Yeah, so there's um, uh, t two different experiences that, that, that I went through, um, which uh, the first one was um, just anything is better than having no job, and, and you might be tempted to just apply to hundreds and hundreds of, of different jobs um, in a sort of shotgun approach, but that really isn't very helpful at all. What you, what you end up doing is wasting a lot of time on really poorly written uh, applications um, to really inappropriate jobs. And um, with someone who's very skilled, especially those of you who have a, a PhD, um, you're not going to get employed as a, as a cleaner because as soon as you get something better, you'll leave, and your employers know that. So don't don't waste your time applying for jobs that you're far too overqualified for. Um, but there's also the, the other hand where you're a bit too confident um, when you're applying for a job, and, and you might find that, oh, yes, I've just come out of academia, and I'm the top of my field in... in spectroscopy so I'm definitely going to get uh, the first job I apply for this this might not happen at all so if you apply for a job and you see something else that comes up do take the time to apply for that even if you're in the interview stages of your first uh, application do take the time to continue applying because you never know and ultimately you want to be in a situation where you've got two offers and you can choose between them rather than having to take the only offer you get um, yeah, so those are some of the things to watch out for, and, yeah. and um, the self-pity zoning out one there is, is all about, uh, it's really fun and really nice sometimes to feel melancholic and, and um, a little depressed, but actually it's a huge waste of time, and you really shouldn't spend too much time on that. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah, keep going, be focused, um, be positive, um, and, and just keep going, really. So this is something else that, that can come up. Um, we're obviously not suggesting for a moment that either of you, any of you are kind of going down this route. But again, it's, this is really just kind of put your notice just to be aware of, you know, a lot of people do turn to other sources of support if they are unemployed or, or feeling down. So, you know, again, it's all about moderation. You know, if you do do any of those things, it's very easy, again, for them to become a, a crutch and to rely on them. Uh, and again, just being aware of that possibility it's kind of more likely to make sure that it that it doesn't happen. Um, so the key thing, really, one of the one of the major th problems that you have when you're unemployed is obviously a lack of money. So being able to apply for financial support is really <coughs> crucial to to getting through this stage of your life. Um, so do you just want to talk a little bit about your experience of this, Fawzi, and how you approached it, what you did? Yes, uh, absolutely. So. Um... Uh, so for those of you in, in the UK, you'll, you'll have heard of the Job Centre, um, and for those uh, sort of international listeners, um, there's lots of different uh, social security or welfare systems around the world. Um, in the UK, there's a bit of an attitude of it's a bit of a shame or somehow disgusting to apply for financial assistance, and um, for th I went for three months without um, seeking any uh, welfare because I thought it was considered horrible. Um, and, and that's such a silly attitude to take, and I realize now that um, that was an immature um, approach, but such is the way of um, uh, the, the, the way the media represents um, things like benefits or job seekers allowance. It's really important for you to, to use the safety net that's available. It's there to provide you with some support. Um, it offers you uh, um, not just money, but also training courses, advice on your CVs. You can get assistance with substance abuse if you have it. Um, it also, in order to get the financial assistance, there are some strict rules in place. Um, you have to spend a certain number of hours a day looking for work, and, and that actually adds some structure to your day, even though um, 
it might not be what you're looking for, it, it does help um, in the long term. There are more details about um, that uh, in the book and online, and of course Rob um, can talk about the Chemist Community Fund. Yeah, so, so, so the Chemist Community Fund is really a, a support system that the RSC does have in place for people that are kind of going through financial difficulty. I'll come back to that a bit more detail kind of towards the end of the presentation, but again, it's just to kind of make you aware that there are a range of other sources of financial support under there. And as Fawzi said, don't be ashamed to, to seek them out. You know, you if you've been paying tax, if you've been paying national insurance, you've been paying that in so that there is money available when you need it. So, you know, do do follow that up. Don't don't just assume that you're that it doesn't apply to you. You know, everyone finds themselves in situations they weren't expecting. Use whatever support you have available to kind of get you out of it really. Mm -hmm. Um, so really, once you do start applying for jobs, there are kind of some things for you to be kind of thinking about, um, and I'll just run through them here, kind of just to kind of get a feel for it, really. So updating online profiles, really important, you know, be it if you're a LinkedIn profile, if you've got one, have you looked at it recently, have you updated it, have you been explicit that you're actually looking for work? People do tend to um, forget that actually if you, if you're unemployed, you've actually got an um, advantage over people that are currently still in work when it comes to LinkedIn. If you're using it for, to attract attention from employers, if you say that you're actively seeking new opportunities, you're much more likely to be approached by someone that does have a role. Whereas if you're currently in work, you tend to hide that. You don't want your current employer to see it. So, you know, again, make the most of that. Um, being able to write tailored CVs, um, Fawzi mentioned this earlier, really important even if you're not unemployed you should be doing this but even more so if you are so there's three jobs there that we've kind of put up um, they're three jobs I think that uh, are very different uh, they're going to be looking for different skills they're going to be looking for different experience so if you're not tailoring your CV to reflect that you're not going to get interviews for any of them um, edit your social media is an interesting one is that something that you did for Z? Um, so I didn't uh, to start with and uh, I went for one interview where someone made a comment about something I posted a year ago um, and I thought well how did you know that information unless you've read oh okay um, thankfully it wasn't anything uh, too embarrassing at all but if you have posted some picture or, or made some sort of perhaps potentially embarrassing comment um, then you might want to consider editing that it's it's usually only going to matter if you're applying to work with a company who takes their marketing really seriously and how they present themselves. Um, so that's something for you to bear in mind. Yeah, I, and I, I would just say, I mean, Facebook particularly does now kind of make it very easy for you to go through and manage your security settings. Um, you know, go through, delete stuff that you know if you posted something after you came in drunk at one or two o'clock in the morning or whatever. Um, it is worth just having a bit of a sense check of what's there. You might be surprised actually what's there. Um, other things to think about as well, consider using recruiters, consider going to job fairs. Um, have you had experience of doing both of those, Fawzi? Yes, I did. Um, so uh, one thing I will say about recruiters, that I didn't really know um, what they were, how to use them properly when I first um, contacted them. Uh, you need to have a good idea of what you want to, to apply for um, and you don't have to stick with one recruitment company you can ha have say um, uh, different recruitment companies uh, will focus on different aspects so if you're interested in science editing um, there'll be a recruitment company that focuses on that and you can send them a CV that's suitable for that kind of job uh, similarly, if you're interested in going down um, a more academic route, then that you'll find uh, recruiters that are aimed at getting people in, back into academia. So when you contact a recruiter, um, be prepared to talk um, in detail about what you've done, and then also uh, talk about your skills and how they're transferable. Sometimes you'll get a recruiter working in a field that they don't fully understand, and, and this is annoyingly common. So you've got to make it really easy uh, for them, but you need them because they've got the foot they can get you through the door. Um, so you have to foster a really good relationship with your recruiter. They're working for you. Um, so it's it's a situation you have to be really careful of. Um, but uh, eventually I, I got um, uh, two interviews from a recruiter. Um, so 
you know, it can can work. Okay. In your favor. I think the other thing I just add to that as well is, is you do quite often have to kind of manage that relationship with them as well as an ongoing relationship. So just kind of meeting with them or talking to them, sending your CV in, that's really the start of your relationship with them. I think you also then have to kind of invest some time into kind of contacting them on a regular basis. So I'm not saying you phone them up twice a day and say, why haven't you got me a job yet? But you can kind of maybe schedule a call once a week just to talk to your contact there. Um, get a feel for kind of what's coming up. Remember, they will have a pipeline of jobs that are being developed, you know. The ones that they haven't advertising yet uh, are the ones that they can't fill. They'll know also the jobs that are coming up that aren't going to get filled. So you can have a chat about who are they going to be meeting with, what jobs do they, do they have coming up, are you suitable for them, would you consider putting them forward. So again, you're kind of proactively managing, managing that relationship just kind of rather than being passive about it. Um, just while we're talking about applying for jobs as well, all of the things up there, the RC career management team of which I'm part can kind of help you with that. And again, we'll have contact information on how to get in touch with us uh, at the end of the webinar as well. So we have talked this about this a little bit, having a targeted approach. So one of the questions that's come up has been about, do you need to tailor your CV to every single role? Um, I would say without doubt, yes. So here's an example um, where the top is quite focused, but the second one becomes much more um, kind of linked to the role that you want to get through. And it's about interpreting your skills and your experience, making it relevant. Is there anything else you wanted to add at this point? Um, no, not really. So um, in, like Rob said, the top paragraph is describing um, something you might put in a CV or a cover letter. Uh, really academic uh, focused uh, detail there and in the bottom paragraph um, it, you're focusing on the transferable skills and your communication in English um, so it's all about tailoring your CV or cover letter and that's how you get a targeted approach yeah and, and again that's something that the career management team can help you with a lot of people do struggle with that particularly if you are coming from a kind of academic background making that transition into industry you know the, the skills you have aren't going to be the aren't going to be different but it's how you present them how you actually make them attractive to, to future employers, really key. And again, we can kind of help with that. So here's some information really about kind of searching for jobs. Do you just want to talk us through this, Fawzi, and kind of why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I found it really important to develop a strategy so that you weren't wasting your time. You, um, when you wake up, you know how, what you're going to do for that day. Um, if you are in two minds about whether you want to work for something academic or something industrial, then why not develop two different uh, online profiles? So you can go to a job search website like um, Indeed or Monster and have that be your searching website for academic jobs or and then go for something like um, a completely different job search site for industrial jobs. Fill out your profile in the various amounts of detail and upload two different CVs for those sites. So when you start using one, you'll be searching for a particular type of job um, and you'll be focused. Um, in, in a normal working day, you might spend, say, seven or eight hours working. So why not spend an equal amount of time searching slash writing? So I would spend the early hours of the morning uh, searching for a particular job and then at the end of the day, I would use the remaining time to rank those jobs that I found interesting in terms of their deadline, how appropriate they were for me, and how easy it was to apply for them. And whatever time I had left over, I would then write an application. If you find that you, you write only one application within um, a day, that's actually a really good start. Um, it's all about spending the time to find suitable jobs and writing a strong uh, application. Uh, that's more important than finding lots of jobs that you're not very good for and writing a poor application. So once you've made the application for a job, um, make sure that you write down the, the time and the date um, and keep a log of what, which CV or cover letter you sent because you won't hear back for at least a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and by that time you might have changed the layout of your CV, you might have changed um, what, you're, what you're using, um, and when you come for an interview you might not remember exactly what you wrote. So if you if you save a copy of what you sent, then you can easily refer to it in any interview. Um, and, if you, and if you're finding that 
your strategy isn't working, then you might want to review it every now and then. Um, say, maybe I'll start writing applications um, every other day, or I'll change the website that I'm using. You, do be confident when you when you apply, even if you think I'm I'm not sure I've got the exact amount of experience for that. If you really like the look of it, then do it. Okay, be bold, but you you've also got to be honest in your applications. Uh, and I think uh, j j just to add to that as well, I think a lot of people when they write a job description, a lot of companies write it for the ideal candidate in mind. Um, that person very rarely exists. So if you've got sort of 60, 70 percent of what they're looking for you should definitely still apply if it interests you. Um, you're probably not going to be able to take every single thing they're looking for, but if you can get to 60 or 70% of it, you're going to be doing pretty well. And going back to that list in your applications, what it can also do is that if you do keep a record of which CVs you're using for which types of roles, as you start to apply for more of those types of roles, you'll find that you need to do less and less tailoring of the CV. So it's not like you're going to be starting from scratch every time you find a brand new role to apply for. If you've applied for something similar in the past, um, you still need to tailor, tailor it a little bit, but again, you won't be starting from scratch, so again, that can kind of save time. I would also just add as well, you don't need to spend every minute of every day kind of it, looking for jobs. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about at the start was kind of taking time out to do other stuff, and you know, that will keep your fr mind fresh, your body fresh, and again, when you do come to to make those applications, you'll be much more focused and they'll be much more better at, uh, as a result of it. Um, obviously, the harder you work, the more like you are likely to get back into work, but don't feel that you have to spend every minute of every hour uh, looking for jobs because that's going to be counterproductive over, over a long period of time. And so the next thing, uh, you mentioned this a little bit, Fawzi, it is a waiting game. Applications take time to be processed. Um, I think that's kind of really key. You know, you're sat there waiting for your the phone to call or the email to come through inviting you for an interview. Um, you've got to bear in mind that it's going to take a while to be processed. There might be lots of applicants. They might be away on business, on holiday, on leave. Uh, there's lots of reasons why they're not going to come back to you straight away. Um, and obviously, if there's a recruitment agency in there as well, that can slow the process further. There's going to be a lot of going back and forth. So, you know, it could take two to four weeks to, to get some, somewhere, to get invited to an interview. Um, if it gets beyond that, yeah, you're probably not going to be in the running. Um, but as Fawzi mentioned earlier, you can still carry on applying while you wait. You're not, a lot of people tend to do it quite linear. They'll kind of apply for a job and wait to see if they're successful. You can't afford to do that. You've got to keep going uh, with other applications while you're waiting, being per um, you know, persevering with a job hunt, asking for feedback. Did you do much of that for Z? I, I did. Um, often you, if you get um, generic email responses saying you've been unsuccessful, um, there'll be a, you won't be able to reply to, to them. But um, nevertheless, do try um, because uh, perseverance and, and being proactive is a very useful uh, skill to demonstrate. And actually, one of the reasons that I got my current job is by asking for uh, feedback. Um, so it is useful. And any information you can get out of that, um, then you can loop back into your application process and, and uh, improve your, your CV and cover letter that way. Okay. That's great. That's all good points. That's all good points. Um, so um, let's assume you are successful. Let's assume you get over the first hurdle. You get invited to, uh, for an interview. Um, Lots of ways of preparing for an interview. Um, these are uh, Fawzi's thoughts. I definitely um, agree with most of them. I'm going to really kind of focus on the practice answering the questions um, because that's something that the RFC, our career management team, can help you with that. Particularly if you are making that switch from an academic career to a non-academic career um, or if you've not been interviewed before or if you haven't been interviewed for a while putting time into actually practicing that is really important. Um, what you tend to find is that you'll come across as much more natural. You won't have to stop and think about the answers. You've actually got them prepared. It shows that you're kind of eager, that you're keen, that you're taking the process seriously. Um, it also gives you a chance, you know, your CV is just there to get you the interview. It's not to kind of, it's not to get you the job. That's what the applicant, that's what the interview is for. So you will be asked to kind of support and expand and develop your your answers based on what you have on the CV, but it's not it's not the be-all and end-all. Do you want to just talk us through the other ones, Fawzi, because they seem a bit more practical? 
Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I found um, was that um, on, a, on a coldy day, you know, when I was, uh, if it was winter and I was unemployed, then I, I completely forgot that not wearing gloves will make my hands really cold. So I, I remember shaking the hands of an interviewer once and going, oh, that's actually really cold hands. So wearing gloves, for example, that's um, quite a sensible thing to do. Um, and if you, I, I once had no mobile phone reception and I couldn't work out how to get um, to where I needed to go using my phone. So luckily I, I drew a map the night before. Um, it, I was actually in Wimbledon. Wimbledon has two different uh, exits for, for the train station. So knowing which entrance to use, for example, is, is a, a very good start. Um, or just don't go to Wimbledon. Um, the, the, the other things like bringing printed documents. Um, if, you, if you're prepared and you've got your CV there, um, it just shows that extra level of determination and preparedness. And um, that can be quite useful for the job that you're applying for. Um, and, and finally, things like uh, LinkedIn, a lot of companies will post on their Twitter or their social media what they've been up to. Um, ha have the company that you're looking to work with uh, gone to a trade show recently? You might want to ask a question about that. So, oh, how, how did your trade show in India go? That just shows that you've been paying attention, that you're interested. Um, so it can really work in your favor. So, so one of the questions that we have to ask is about your approach to research in the company, uh, the role in the technical requirements for an interview so you know looking at the news looking at their company websites looking at press releases looking at their social media um all that information is out there and you've just got to kind of got to think about what you want to find out what questions you want to ask as a result um i think understanding the role that you're going for in the context of the company as a whole is really important so if you can find out anything about you know what you think the role is how that relates to their products and services is it to develop a new product is it to enter a new market um, you know what's the, what's the reason for the role how did that role come into being anything you can kind of glean from the website from uh, other sources of information about that I think is really useful and if you can't you know they're the sort of questions that, that you should be asking so another aspect of preparing for the interviews is actually thinking about what questions you actually going to ask when you actually get there so in the interview, this is a really good one. Never assume they've read your CV. Um, sounds a bit odd, that one. But um, I've, met, I've worked with a lot of people that are very busy. Quite often the HR department or the recruiter is the one that are putting the candidates forward to be interviewed. Quite often someone, the person that says, yes, you are going to have an interview, isn't going to be the only person on the interview board. Um, so, you know, be aware that they may not have read your CV. Be aware that you need to probably go over it all again. Um, do you want to just talk about this one a little bit uh, for yeah. you? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was obviously very nervous about having to admit uh, that I was unemployed. Um, but what you've got to remember um, is to stay positive and be focused. As Rob said, interviewers are very, very busy. So they're not going to want to meet someone who they don't think is a viable candidate. So focus on why they've invited you. Um, and you can even ask them, you know, uh, why are you interested in me? Um, uh, the interviewers will often ask, why do you want to work for our company? Um, it's perfectly legitimate for you to say, you know, they're interested in me and try and work out what it is about you. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, with, with, the, with that time that you've got, um, uh, you, know, you are employed, you, you're, what have you been doing? Well, you've been volunteering, have you been reading, have you been um, helping out in the community? These are all ways you can demonstrate communication skills, uh, for example, or um, uh, being able to uh, engage with lots of various people. These are wonderful skills that you can do um, while unemployed and demonstrate. So don't be ashamed or afraid to admit you're unemployed. Um, in fact, the fact that you're continuing to apply means that you're resilient, and that's a really crucial skill to demonstrate and employers really like. And I think the other thing I'd, I'd add to that as well, the fact that you're unemployed actually puts you in a really good position from their point of view, because chances are they're going to want to fulfill the position very quickly. So if you don't have a notice period to work, you can start next week for them. So again, that's going to be really important for you. I think also the other thing about talking about what you'll do while you're in, unemployed, again, that it doesn't just demonstrate that the skills, it demonstrates that really kind of you're kind of a, a proactive mindset as well. So again, that's another way to kind of present it in a way that's quite positive to your future employer. Um, and I'll just reiterate that point, you know, they're only going to be interviewing you 
if they like you, if they're interested in something in you. If you can find that out what that is, again, that's something you can feed through to other CVs if you're not successful. But, you know, it's another reason to be positive about, about the experience as well. So I mentioned earlier, think about the sort of questions you do want to ask. Um, it is a two-way process. A lot of people, particularly if you're unemployed, you're so desperate, you're so happy to have an interview that you kind of forget about this. You know, you, you want them to like you, you want them to give you a job offer. But I've had interviews where I've actually come out of it and thought, actually, no, I don't want to work there. So, you know, be prepared to find out what you need to find out to decide if you really want to work there or not. Um, really good for clarifying the job descriptions. So what is the role? You know, why is the role there, as I mentioned earlier? But again, it's a good importance to be able to show that you're keen, that you're interested, that you're engaged. One of the things that sticks in the mind with employers is people that show a real interest in the job, that really come across as really positive, enthusiastic about the role. You know, when they ask you the question about why you want the role, that's, you know, they're going to ask you that. You need to have a really good answer to that, that you need to practice, you need to think about. If you can't answer that question well to yourself, chances are you won't answer it well in the interview either. And also it means that you're probably, you know, it may not even be the, the role that's right for you. So this goes back to being quite focused in your applications. Um, and yeah, as Fawzi mentioned, you know, determine why, why, why are they interested in hiring you? Again, that even if you don't get this particular role, it's good feedback for you that you can take on and make the most of in, in future applications. Things to do after the interview. Um, thanking the interviewers. That could just be at the interview itself. It could be as a follow-up email. Um, if you're unsuccessful, as Fawzi mentioned there, it's likely to either be by a email or by phone, uh, not so much in writing these days, but it does happen occasionally. Um, consider reapplying. That's an interesting one. Uh, we've met people in the careers team that have been rejected for a job. Um, if the job is then subsequently re-advertised, you know, there's nothing to stop you reapplying, but, you know, think about maybe why you weren't successful. Is it that they asked you for something that you didn't uh, kind of explain or sh demonstrate properly you know we people do get jobs after they've been rejected it first time over so do consider reapplying for it particularly I think if you really want it um, being able to ask for feedback um, that's really useful um, you know if you have been to the interview stage chances are you may be in with a shout of getting some you know it may be simply that you know or someone was more experienced or you know you didn't quite have what they're looking for you know, there's not a lot you can do about that, but if there is any insight you can gain for it, do try and get it. If you don't ask for it, you definitely won't get it. But if you ask, yeah. Uh, uh, what I'd just add is that yeah. um, is that when you when you do email um, the uh, the interviewers, you can allude to discussions that you've had um, if you forgot to answer a question, for example. And even if you um, even if you get a rejection. Uh, asking for feedback is very useful, um, and I've certainly done that. And people have gone on to give me links, or uh, I've even asked, "Would you uh, consider me for future suitable roles?" So you can you can definitely get something out of it. Maintain a very good um, relationship uh, with your interviewer because the world is very small. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make. Okay, um, so if you do receive an offer. Um, things to be thinking about, you know, do you have a salary range in mind? Um, you know, if they ask you your salary expectations, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Do the research, you know, what are other jobs offering, what are other jobs that are advertised offering. The RSC does a pay and reward survey every, every couple of years again, so again, you can kind of use that. Um, types of offers you might get, quite often it's in person or on the phone, quite often they want to phone you up and ask, you know, offer you the job because they want a, a reply straight straight away, and they want to give you the good news. Um, don't be afraid to ask for time, um, not just for negotiation, but you know if you're considering other offers, or if you've had other interviews that you're kind of waiting to hear back from. You know, asking for time to think about it. Yeah. You know, don't be hasty. Um, that's really important. And is that something that you kind of did for Z? Were there offers that you had that you didn't take up? Yeah, I, I was certainly nervous about um, how I had, how I was going to deal with um, the offers that I sort of reached 
stage where I knew I was going to get an offer and um, I actually got three offers within the space of um, a week and um, we don't have time to talk about them now but in the book I, I give examples where I've received an, e uh, an email, uh, a phone in, uh, offer and an on offer in person and it's really important to thank the, the interviewer but you have to say with confidence that um, you'd like some time to think about it and they'll obviously agree um, because they don't want someone who's going to say yes immediately uh, they, so don't be hasty and um, actually they'll respect you for, for considering it because it's a very important thing you know, um, working uh, with someone so you want to take the time to think about it um, there you go yeah I definitely agree with that I definitely agree with that you know it's very easy particularly if you are employed to rush into a particular role because you need a role you need some money but again you know that can actually create problems down the line um, so really kind of accept it after accepting an offer you know it's, it's not done yet you know um, I personally have been offered a, a job um, and then had it retracted before the contract was signed. So, you know, do, you're nearly there, you are pretty much there, but it's not quite over yet. So, you know, there are references, you might need to decline the offer, um, sign the contract if they do sign it through, if they do send it through, if you're happy to accept it. Um, do you want to talk about uh, the kind of sign off and the other kind of things as well? That you've got um, I'll talk about the, the points below, um, but, uh, but Sometimes you'll um, you'll get to the contract through um, with the offer email, and um, you might not want to sign it because you might want to uh, renegotiate that salary. So, it, you, when you sign it, is really important. So do take the time. Um, if you do accept, and the other things you have to do. So if you're on social welfare, you are obliged to tell them and get off that. Um, if you've got a recruiter working for you looking for jobs, then you have to tell them. It's just professional courtesy. You might want to uh, organise childcare. Sometimes there'll be a, um, a two to three week waiting period before you start the position. So you've got a bit of time to get everything organised um, if you need to move out, for example. And you've also got that time to maintain the activities you've been getting used to. So stay active. That's great. So, um, so really just kind of winding up now, just in summary, you know, keep active. I think that's kind of really important. That's the kind of take home message from today, you know, being positive, being, you know, keep active mentally and physically, really, really important. Um, you know, don't give up, do be persistent. Do you just want to share how long you were looking for a job for Z? Um, yes. So, uh, officially a year, um, and that was, a. Uh, that could have been cut down a lot had I not made all those mistakes and um, I, I give a bit more detail um, about the silly things I did uh, in the book. So the key things are to keep uh, active mentally and um, make your approach more targeted and structure your day. Um, so yes, uh, it was a horrible time but you can get through it by staying positive um, and um, being a bit more uh, structured in your approach. Yep, so again, you know, being out, of work, being out of work for a year, you still do can get back into it. Um, so, you know, do keep do keep plugging away. So I did mention, like, seek sources of help if you do it. Here are some links uh, for some more information. So the financial support that I mentioned, and the Chemist Community Fund, um, that's support from the RSC itself. Um, the government website there, that's the UK government, obviously. You know, if you're in another country, you may have another alternative. Um, there's information there on job hunting, so where to job hunt. Um, if you're looking for academic jobs, jobs.ac.uk is a good one. If you're looking for industry jobs, I'd definitely start with indeed.co.uk, which I haven't put up there, so apologies, but that's listed on the job seeking page on the RSC website. Um, Help with applications and CVs. Again, that's something that the RSC can help with. If you want to get in touch with us, if you have a role that's coming up that you want to apply for, we can review CVs, we can review cover letters before you send it off. So do get in touch with us if you're in that situation. Uh, there's a link on the on the screen there as well to, to Fawzi's book. Um, if you can't get it all down now, uh, don't worry, we will be uploading it hopefully to YouTube so you can go through um, and access it through that. Um, so that's linked to more information. I just wanted to finish off really just by talking a little bit more about the Chemist Community Fund, um, which is basically the working name for the RSC's Benevolent Fund. Um, this has been going really to kind of support chemists um, 
really uh, is, is governed by a trustee, so we are a separate charity to the rest of the RSC. But the objective is really about relieving po poverty among the beneficiaries. So if you've been a member of the RSC for uh, three years, um, you can apply to us for help. Um, so if you do find yourself in financial difficulties, get in touch with the Chemist Community Fund. We can help with that. Uh, we can support some financial help, but we can also do a lot of work to signpost you to other sources of uh, support as well and information. So it can offer financial support. We've got a signposting. Um, and we also have uh, state to kind of get support from volunteer visitors who are members that can come out and kind of support you in your own home as well. So um, if you do need help, you know, you're not on your own, we can help you with that. So the financial support that the Chemist Community Fund offers, um, we can offer charitable grants to help with essential living costs, uh, one-off grants for particular things. So obviously if you're unemployed, you don't they don't have a lot of disposable money, but if there are specific things, specific lar large bits of expenditure you need help with, we can help with that. Um, and also grants for kind of training for other sorts of information as well. Uh, the career coaching, that's really on top of what the uh, careers team offers as well. So I'd say get in touch with the careers team first um, and see what we can do to help, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, the signpost advice and guidance, uh, lots of professional resources from other types of organisations we can we can help with, as well as the careers team with our kind of careers guidance at any stage of your career really. Uh, volunteer visitor I mentioned as so again if you need help with completion of forms, uh, befriending visits if you're finding that you're isolated since you've become unemployed, again we can kind of help with that. Uh, if you do want to get in touch with uh, the Chemist Community Fund, there's the contact information on the screen at the moment. It's just benfund at rsc.org, or you can phone 01223 432 227, uh, and the staff in the office will kind of know how best to kind of route your inquiry. Um, so that's really it for me. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, good luck um, in your job searches. That's all the contact information for me up there as well. Um, I'll just check as well on the questions. So if you do have any other questions that you don't think has been covered so far, um, do type them in. We've had a few that come up. Um, we've had a lot that have come up now that I go through it. So um, yeah, so someone's mentioned the need to chase up recruiters after they fail to update, uh, especially if the application is unsuccessful. I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah, if you want to find out information about companies, then log on to Companies House. Find out more information about the company and the turnover. Again, that's useful. Again, you can kind of look at how that trend is going. Is it going up or going down? Again, that can kind of help you decide if you want to work there. Uh, the slides will be available um, on, on YouTube. Um, so uh, do keep an eye on that. That will be linked to from, from the main RFC website. Um, let's just go back to the top of the questions, see if there's any other questions. So we talked about how much tailoring of the CV. I think we've said like it's got to be for each role. I know it's a pain, but actually you're much better off doing several good tailored ones than lots of general ones. Um, Fawzi, how, how useful did you find the scientific recruitment agencies? Did you do um, Well, I didn't find them very efficient to start with because um, I didn't really have a very good idea of how to use them. but. Um, when I did, I realized actually they, they were very useful. They, they don't always know um, a lot about the science. So you've got to explain um, your skills. Um, so for example, if you, if you know spectroscopy, um, they don't know what that means. All they know is UV, Viz, or FTIR, because the companies they are going to send your CV to will say, we do UV, Viz, we do FTIR. So make it easy for them, um, and that's, that's the approach that I, I would recommend. That's great. We've also had a question about um, signing on for job seeker allowance. Um, so that they make the point that quite often the, the kind of local job centre doesn't understand the difference between kind of the, the career professional jobs that we might be going for and um, those kind of uh, lower skilled jobs that, that might be available. How, how did you manage that relationship with them, Fawzi? Did you make the, the definition? How did you actually kind of <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm not surprised. Um, yes, 
it is it can be a bit tricky to explain to them but um, you just have to persevere so go in and um, make sure that you explain the situation well and that um, if you apply for um, just any old job you're unlikely to be successful because you're overqualified so I think don't don't consider that the person you, you get to be completely uh, ignorant um, obviously you're going to have different uh, they're called work coaches and they all have different skill sets so you might have to do a bit more explanation you might have to do a little less um, but just explain it to them like you would to any normal human being and uh, I'm sure you'll be fine that's great, that's great. <laughs> How many interviews did you go through before you got your own your own role? Do you remember? I think I went. Yes, I think um, so. There were five or six um, different companies were interviewing me, um, and uh, I went through three uh, or two interviews per company. Um, and you know, usually you only get up two or three, depending on the number of, uh, of applicants. And by the second or third, you'll know now they're interested to see if you've got a good fit. So the first interview is usually about um, uh, do you actually have the skills? And the second interview is usually about, OK, you've got the skills, but will I actually like working with you? Um, so, so you have to apply a different approach to each one. OK. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, we've also had a question about advice for non-UK master's degrees and experience. Um, so I think what I'd say to that is if you are kind of applying to a UK job, if you, they don't necessarily, as long as you're entitled to work in the UK, they don't necessarily mind where you got your degree or experience from. What's key is that you present it in a way that makes it um, applicable to them. So look at the job description, look at the, the person spec, what are they asking for, and then think about what experience you have that is relevant to that, and then present that on your CV, um, and hopefully you'll, ha you'll have some success. So thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Thanks very much for your time. I hope you found it useful. Hope you found it interesting. Fawzi, thanks very much for your time as well. Um, thanks, Tom. Just had one question about applying to the USA. Um, often they need a visa, yep, um, to be honest, you're going to have to look at what the entry requirements are, what the visas are to actually getting a job. Um, you know, obviously we, we can't get around the kind of legal uh, boundaries to kind of travel and work that, that companies put on them. So if they do need a visa, think about how you're going to get it, what, what programs they have in place, whether the company sponsor you. Uh, that's really the kind of only advice that I can kind of really offer on that, I'm afraid. Um, I don't think there's any kind of shortcut about that. I think you have to kind of have a conversation maybe with a company you might want to apply for and see if they would be willing to, to sponsor you to get that. Um, but they may not. So, again, you're kind of a bit at the mercy of the employers. There's not too much you can do about that, I'm afraid. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, it's been brilliant. Um, Hopefully we'll have this up on YouTube fairly soon. Do keep an eye out on it um, and good luck with your job hunts.